Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. Uh, I'm Joe, and with me today is Francis Horton of the Hell of a Way to Die podcast. How's it going, Francis? Oh, it is fantastic. I'm here. I'm here to do some history. I'm excited. Uh, do a big old history. I'm excited to be Nick in this one because I've done. You told me slightly what it was about, and I did zero research, so I can just here sit here and be like, "Damn!" and "That's fucked up!" and "What the fuck!" <laughs> Like you, all you need is a soundboard of Nick being like, "No, nah, that's fucked up," and you've got you, you know, in case Nick is never there, you just hit that every time you finish a paragraph. What if I told you there was no Nick, and all <laughs> I had was like a soundboard from some soldier that I recorded while drunk? You have uh, a very elaborate backstory for Nick, then. Uh, it, it's been a work in progress. I work on some characters from time to time. Uh, I also have break their legs. Uh, <laughs> Joe has actually never been to war. He's just a really good improv uh, actor. Yeah, the improving the TVI was a real bitch. Uh, it required a couple running my my head into the walls. Uh, my dogs are real concerned for my health. I mean, it's uh, real tragic. What is a deployment other than a year long? Yes, and. You're not wrong, or, or uh, figuratively running your head into the wall. <laughs> uh, so I thought today would be a good, uh, good time to have you on uh, because you've been in the army a very long time. So you and you're a public affairs uh, uh, NCO. So you probably are kind of like the subject matter expert for like glossing over the army's fuck ups. <laughs> Certainly, uh, certainly, I have been. It's not. I, I would say it's not a cover up. We. It's. It's getting ahead of the story and putting a posi- right. putting a positive spin on it. Uh, so, have you ever uh, been privy to, or witnessed, or had to report on like just some really dumb training accidents? No, but I know people who I, I have. I have been around them and been in the PAO shop that has had to deal with it, and uh, generally, like. Depending on the like, I don't know, depending on the severity, generally you just put out like a very basic like kind of uh, uh, press release or a very short news story that's got like the who, what, where, when, like you know, four soldiers involved in LMTV rollover on the base today, you know, injured, they will be out of the hospital or something, and. You know, it, when you want to go a little bit further in depth, you get, you know, a soundbite from the base commander or the commander of the unit that was involved. And you're just like, we're, you know, doing safety and we're going to wrap all of our LMTVs in uh, reflective belts and that's going to save us all. So, you know, something something along those lines. Yeah, I've never been on that side of it. I've been the one getting in training accidents for the most part. Uh, like I know um, Nick has gone to NTC about four times uh, because he hasn't deployed, but they're trying to make up for that by sending him to NTC on a, an annual basis. <laughs> Guess what? We're still going to send you somewhere where it fucking sucks. They actually uh, almost sent him to JRTC in a leg cast very recently. <laughs> uh, so he's had like uh, multiple rotations where people get ran over by tanks. Um, I remember once uh, I accidentally chopped off a guy's pinky with a Humvee uh, uh, guard, the thing that's in front of the hood, because uh, there was like a rock wedged in it. And uh, they were trying to clean out their pinky. And without telling us, and you know, it's like a cigar cutter. So I lifted it up. His pinky came right off. Uh, <laughs> he was also my roommate in the barracks, which made things really fucking awkward. Uh, uh, you sorry, get, Lawrence. No, nah, did, did they? Did they? Were they able to glue it back on? No, it, he lost just. It was just the tip. <laughs> oh. he, he he lost like half a fingernail. Uh, it was pretty gross. Oh, uh, so no, um, so no disability then. See, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna injure me. If you're going to injure me in a training accident or something, you need to at least be getting me 20%. Oh, definitely. Uh, like, put me into a river, roll my tank over, do something. Um, right. Like, me, yeah. I'd be the one going back. Like, you didn't get enough. Just try it again. <laughs> let, me, let me put the whole pinky all up in there. Um, like, I've heard stories of people getting shot. Um, you know, uh, I have, there's a tank at Fort Knox that... I was nearby and that launched a main gun round into the next city um, due to a problem with the with the gun or, or it was actually the gunner. But whoops, uh, you know, say, training accidents happen. Is it that thing where I know you tankers talk about like when you when you're set for HE and you shoot Sabbat or something like that and then you accidentally blow around to the moon? 
Yeah, pr- from what my understanding, that's pretty much what happened. And uh, the you know, master gunner had a stroke, and <laughs> everybody got fucked up. <laughs> We hit the yeah. we hit the button that said shoot too far instead of the button that says shoot just right. And uh, you know what? It's 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 a it's a thing that's in the M1 Abrams. Hopefully, the next gen will have that button taken out. Yeah, it, it it'll just be dumber and controlled by a drone or something. Um, yeah, AI controlled tank name guns. I'm sorry, you can make a tank dumber than having a PFC in charge of it. Uh, you can make a dumb tanker. Uh, I mean, you can make a a tank dumber by putting four tankers in it. I, I can attest to that. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to set the mood here for what might be, uh, and I think is the worst training accident in human history. Uh, so on June 6th, 1944, nearly 300,000 allied military personnel took part in Operation Overlord, otherwise known as D-Day, one of the largest operations of all of World War II. Their goal, of course, is to storm the beaches of Normandy, break through the so-called Atlantic Wall, and cut the heart of the Nazi war machine out in Berlin. This is not that story, so sorry to get your hopes up. Uh, so as anybody is probably aware now from school or Medal of Honor games or whatever, Operation Overlord was a hugely imp- important operation for the Allied forces in the, con- in the conduct of the war. That is because not only were they going to storm Western Europe, the heart of the Nazi Empire, they're going up was against thought to be one of the strongest defenses in all of human conflict up until that time. This was known as Festung Europa, or Fortress Europe. This is mostly a propaganda term used by Nazis and has since been co-opted by our history books. Good job, historians. Uh, to describe how they plan to fortify all of Europe to protect themselves from the Allied invasion they knew would someday be coming after their failures at the Battle of Britain. Uh, are you at all familiar with the giant array of shit they put up in, in Western Europe? Uh, the, the Nazis? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously there's like those those fortified pillboxes. There's they they had the beaches covered with like um, tank traps and stuff uh, so that you couldn't get you know vehicles up the beach. I know, like, look, I I watch Saving Private Ryan. So, uh, but other, but you know, like oh, that makes you a subject matter expert. I I I I now cede the podcast to you. Well, well, like when, when you think about like you know the last twenty years of war that we've done, everything has been you know quote, permanent, like, semi-permanent, like, bases and fighting fortifications. Like, we put up a HESCO barrier and stuff, and that makes you a, or a T-wall, but, like, it doesn't take long to put those up. Like, these were, like, pillboxes that were, like, some engineer and, like, foundation had to be laid, and they had to pour concrete, and they had to, like, you know, it, it's basically, it's something that, like, somebody planned out. So this was a, like, um, th- this wasn't so much like, oh, shit, the Allies are coming, get some fucking arty rounds down there. It's you know, there there is a lot of planning to to keep this uh, to keep this festooned or fortressed, I suppose. Yeah, and it's something that I think the scale has been kind of lost. Like I know personally, uh, when I think of the Atlantic Wall, I think of kind of Saving Private Ryan. You know, they got a pillboxes, some some wire. They have you know dragon's teeth. Uh, you know, the 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 tank traps on the beaches, and that w- that was it. That's that's kind of what it's shown to be. Um, but that's kind of it forfeits the massive scale and just the sheer dumbassery of the nazi leadership that went into the production of this thing uh so in 1942 hitler ordered the construction of what would now be known as the atlantic wall in what is now known as the directive 40 uh mass construction would begin under the command of the german army not any kind of like construction firm uh so it's it's pretty uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, mostly people who subscribe to uh, PragerU, think national socialism is socialism. Uh, pretty much the entire conduct of the war, uh, as far as uh, weapons procurement, was done by corporations like Porsche, uh, BMW, Volkswagen. Uh, they even took part in the, in the Holocaust, stuff like that. Uh, but this was actually under the, this massive construction effort was under the command of the Wehrmacht, which is a supremely stupid idea. Um, now this would eventually cover 2000 miles of Northern Europe. Uh, now obviously this wasn't going to be a solid 2000 mile long wall. Anyone who thinks you could string a lone wall effectively unbroken and securely over 7,000 miles of, of land is pretty stupid. I think we could all agree that giant walls are dumb (laughs) and a waste of resources, uh, which is why we don't do them anymore. Um, 
anymore. Oh, oh, uh, don't anyway, we? Uh, why is it? <laughs> nope. Why is it that like it, it? It's always like when you go back in history and like you read about like Nazi leadership and Italian leadership during World War II, and then like looking at stuff now and just like. Why are fascists, like, why do they get in charge, but also are just, like, the dumbest human beings ever? Like, it really says... I think it's aesthetics. It says something about, like, humanity in general that you're just like, yeah, I'm gonna follow this guy, and then they, they like, Hitler, who's just like, oh, I'm just gonna fucking sleep in for a bit, and then nobody wake me under pain of death, otherwise, you know, and they're like, oh, we're getting, we're getting shot, and like, ah, uh, I mean, I'd rather get shot by the Allies than shot by Hitler, I guess, so... Don't wake him up. Don't don't get baby up or anything. And you know now we've got a guy who, you know, just gets up and like his brain melts out of his ears, and everybody's just like, <laughs> everybody's just like, yeah, man, that's what that's that's the shit that I'm into. That's what I want. I don't, I don't get it, but you know, he's he's really. I mean, at least Hitler was a good orator, I guess. Like he got up there and he was able to pound a table with the best of them. He had a really weird habit of like practicing his poses. Have you ever seen those pictures? Yeah. He'd, Which, he'd practice his poses and have his photographer take pictures of him so he could judge them later on. I, you know what, though? I get that. Uh, from, look, I, I need to preface this. I am in no way uh, saying that, you know, you've got to hand it to Hitler. But uh, <laughs> but I get that from a public speaking like thing where, like, if you want to um, if you want to be good, if you want to get better at public speaking, what do you do? You get up in front of like a small group of people. Uh, you have people, you know, tell you about it. Sometimes maybe you take video of yourself just so you can see like, oh, I'm, you know, standing weird or I can see that I'm sweating and I need to, you know, work on this or that. So like, I, I understand, you know, the, the, the practice, uh, there, what I don't understand is, you know, the, the genociding that's not, I don't get that part, but you know, the, the practice for, for, for speeches, I'm, I'm with him on that. Yeah, he was definitely, uh, he had one thing right. Also, like, the not smoking in restaurants thing. Yeah, so, he like, was vegetarian. <laughs> he owned a dog. Like, I mean, so much of so much of Hitler, if you're just, like, if you take this little small chunk, like, Hitler would have been, like, a dude in Soho. He's got a weird mustache. He's got a dog. He's a vegetarian. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. Like, all right, Hitler sounds pretty good. And then you just, like, pull back the camera a little bit. You're like, oh, God, oh, God. Oh, God, no. No, this is bad now. Yeah. This is bad. Pull it back in. The only difference between him and like the beat generation guys is like they got a publishing deal because he was on a fuckload of uh, of drugs too. So like if if some art school assholes would have let Hitler in, they w- he would have just like painted the 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 visual shitty beat version of the road. What what if hate and Ashbury in the seventies? Except we gave everybody a gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, you know, that is probably some kind of dystopian <laughs> novel that should be written. Um, you're either going to get shot or fall on a pile of needles. Um, so the Atlantic Wall would actually be a three-tier system of fortification. There'd be like an op- observation points, listening posts uh, that would stretch for, all the way from the Franco-Spanish border all the way to the tip of Norway. Uh, important and strategic points like Cherbourg, Brest, and Antwerp would be des- designated specially uh, Built fortresses and they'd be defended and uh, have like huge caches of supplies. Secondary areas like ports, radar posts, military bases would have independent commands that they, and they would decide how their area uh, defense would work. So when you broke through one area, there'd be a completely independent command to resist you. Another, it was it was a decent design on paper until like a lot of things until you roll it out into the real real world without testing it at all. Um, I like to think of the Atlantic War Wall, like that scene in Lord of the Rings when they're like Gondor calls for aid. They're like Berlin calls for aid, and they all just like start shooting their guns in the air to like let the next <laughs> people know. It's like, oh fuck! It's probably a better communication system than some of the ones that were that are going to be used in this podcast. Unfortunately, uh, bad things happen. Of course, large beaches like the ones that uh, that would be split up during Operation Overlord would be heavily fortified, some uh, much more than others. And it was seemingly random because they, uh, you know, the big uh, the big trick is, you know, the Allies use big inflatable tanks and fake armies to get them to believe that the that the the, the invasion was going to come somewhere else, and then they would hit them at Normandy, where they kind of also thought it was going to happen, but not so much. So there's a really weird arraying of defenses that only made sense if you have like the fever dreams of a half insane fascist dictator. Um, so this is an engineer project so large and ridiculous and obscenely wasteful of supplies. It could have only happened in Nazi Germany. 
Now, while design and construction began in 1942, a time when the Nazis were already short on supplies, uh, because they not really finished their rearmament from the pre-World War II armistice, uh, it was a situation they found themselves from the beginning of the war. And by the time that it started or finished two years later, the Germans' position was now much more dire. But through all of that, construction never stopped. Uh, But the construction materials did get marketably shittier. Uh, Now, if there's the one thing that the Nazis were good at, other than dumb mustaches and horrific genocide, it was blowing through resources on really dumb projects that were thought up as the fever dreams of a deranged strongman. Just to put numbers on how much... It's like every day is another F-35. Uh, this honestly, this wall might be the dumbest engineering project uh, that I've ever covered. Uh, F thirty five is definitely the the more modern version of this. Um, except this actually killed people that it was supposed to kill. Um, the F thirty five just kills its pilots. Um, so just to put into numbers how dumb and how much shit that they wasted uh, on this wall. So they wasted one point two million tons of steel. Enough for 20,000 Tiger tanks, which is 20, time more, 20 times more Tigers than the Nazi war machine ever managed to build, and more tanks they'd ever be able to field during any length of the war in any number at all. Good thing they wouldn't need those later. Now, when you say, when you say waste, what does that mean? Like, what happened to the steel? Well, it was put into various fortifications that would just never be used. Uh, <laughs> but that's, not, that's so, not necessarily a waste, though, right? Like, if I'm just thinking like, okay, we're going to build like, I mean, obviously not a physical wall, but like, all right, we're going to, you know, there's a huge beach here and we're just going to build pillboxes and throw a bunch of Nazi soldiers there and say, you know, if anything comes, you know, shoot it. And then nobody comes. Is that a waste or is this, are these like construction projects that like, even if somebody had shown up, they'd been like, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and step over this and uh, keep on moving. Uh, it depended vastly on where you happen to be along the line. Obviously, in like strong points like Normandy and some of the others, that they'd be much much stronger. But at the same time, there was never any hope of these defenses working at all. Gotcha. Never. Okay. <laughs> uh, a lot. Of, obviously, a lot of this has to do with a small country such as Germany attempting to defend all of Europe from various different powers all at once. Um, but also, it has to do with the fact that Germany themselves uh, pioneered Blitzkrieg. Uh, now, Blitzkrieg is more of a propaganda term for maneuver warfare, but you know they, they kind of pioneered that. So they should have known static defenses were not going to work. Um, this is a lot like me purposely giving myself a bad med- dosage of medication. I should know better, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty much every army medic ever. Um, now, they, they use 17 million cubic meters of concrete, which is enough for 1,100 Yankee stadiums. Uh, and just the French part of the wall with modern inflation and currency exchange included, which is you know, kind of a finicky figure, uh, of around $206 billion in today bucks. It should be noted that this is more uh, of the entire budget of both the Chinese and Russian armed forces combined. But still, four hundred or four hundred billion dollars less than the U.S. budget because we are a sick, sick people. Uh, so, I mean, you have a country that is. I mean, in no world was was the the, the Nazis ever going to win this war. But um, you're now fighting a two front war, then which would turn into a three front war, um, and you're already critically short on supplies because they started the war off not thinking this war was going to last. You know, five years. They thought they would storm through take over France, it would be over. Um, boy, boy, maybe boy th- have I heard that one before. Yeah, uh, yeah real quick in and out adventure. Uh, <laughs> we'll be greeted as liberators, and then we'll, we'll all go home. It'll be great. Yeah. Uh, and, like, they had plans to, like, talk to Britain and, and, Amer- and, and America into a peace to keep everybody out of the war. Obviously, they didn't pan out because everybody involves fucking nuts. But, like, they didn't plan for this to go on very long because, you know, a lot of what we understand about German war efforts during World War II is a, is a propaganda push that they put out that we've kind of bought as whole cloth truth. Um, like the Blitzkrieg, the vast majority of the German army was still pulled by pack animals or walking. They were not an, a mechanized army for the most part. Um, but 
they still use maneuver warfare because it helps when you're fighting you know, an incredibly overmatched Polish uh, army that's split in two by the Soviets as well. So like they had a lot of successes, um, but they started off like the rearmament was not complete when World War II started, when they started it. Um, even because like even uh, the the this, the high command of the German army was telling Hitler like yo we are not ready for this and they like that's why they call the the, the area that turned into the phony war because they had no idea they were going to succeed by fighting as so little as they did like it was mind blowing to them they're sitting in Paris so because you know you have to remember everybody in charge of the German army in World War Two fought in World War One for the most part so. You know, they fought for years and years and years to go 10 feet, and they just drove into Paris with very little effort. But didn't they go around, like, through the mountains, and everybody was like, they'll never do that. And then they did, and then all the They French went were- through the woods. <laughs> they, they literally just cut through the woods. <laughs> like, the, Fr- the French were never, like, you know, seven or ten-year-old boys just, like, wandering around the woods playing soldier, and the Germans were just like, this is our shit, actually. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, they like they couldn't possibly fit through there, or drive tanks through there. Yeah, well, they did. <laughs> oh, shit, what can a tank do? Run over trees? Damn it! Nobody thought about this. I mean, the 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 tanks that they built at the time of them when the Maginot Line uh, was conceptualized really were giant piles of shit. <laughs> so like, they wouldn't really think of thought of as as like modern machinery. Uh, for the most part, all the the Western armies had uh with france being kind of an exception france actually had some really good tanks when world war ii started their tanks were actually better than germany's they just didn't use them correctly um they were still using them as infantry support formations rather than like actual armored maneuver groups so they got badly mauled but you know tanks weren't thought of as the future of warfare so they're like yeah they're not just gonna walk through there uh Whoops. newsflash they're still not <laughs> Oh, I'm slayed. Uh, <laughs> now, um, don't worry, we'll, thought, we'll get into why the airborne troops are no longer useful to, right now either. But go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I would say tanks can at least do something other than wear stupid hats. But, you know, whatever. I would rather be in a tank than jumping out of an airplane. Yeah. So everybody else who is in high. <laughs> uh, now, if you thought that Germany wasn't going to be like totally evil about this building a giant literal wall of fascism, you'd be wrong. Shocker. Only a few of the workers on the wall, like one out of a thousand, were actually Germans, and they're normally the supervisors. Where did they get the rest of those workers, you're wondering? Eh, you already know where the answer's coming. Albert Speer's Organization Tote supplied the German army with literally hundreds of thousands of slaves, many of which were killed from overwork, accidents, or outright executions while on the job. Many of the ones who managed to survive the work probably didn't survive the war because they went back to concentration camps. Uh, now, the best part of this is after all of this is complete, all the work's done, Erwin Rommel, the commander of the slave fortresses, looked over it and said, this isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the even dumber part of this is like we just talked about is the entire German military should have known it wasn't going to work. If you're educated in military hubris, you should know that the Nazi army started the the Western theater of world war two by storming right through the Maginot line, uh, which was a giant series of fortifications that covered the French border and looks suspiciously a lot like the Atlantic wall. Yeah. If I can, it, the, this sounds, you know, on, on par, like the Nazis doing this is like George Lucas making the phantom menace where you're just like, everybody's just like going along with it. Cause you're just like, okay, new star Wars. All right, cool. We're finally going to get it. And then like, Everybody, like, the people who see it first are just like, I don't think that this was a good idea. And then everybody kind of has to go along with it because they haven't gotten a new Star Wars, except with with genocide. <laughs> yeah, somehow. Um, I don't the, think the George Star- Lucas murdered anybody. We don't know that for sure. We don't know what he's hiding in that giant goiter. Uh, like, the, the Star Wars prequels can only look good in comparison to slave labor. So that's 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 a hell of a flex. <laughs> I mean, I think the Nazis might be the only people dumb enough to accidentally foreshadow their own downfall, which is kind of impressive when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't just do this. This won't. This couldn't possibly happen to us. It, shout out to the Nazis for like creating. This is why people love World War II so much, is because it's such like a, a romance novel, and like 
the bad guys are always cartoonishly bad. Like, like <clears throat> Hitler has the dumb mustache, but like in a different world, in a different story, he'd be like twirling his mustache. It's like, ah, I've got it now. You know, it, it, it's like James Bond villain level. This like, oh, well, this, you know, overly complicated laser slowly goes up to, to cut you in two, allow me to explain all of my plans and how to turn off the bomb. And, uh, and you know, th- there's no way that this could ever go go wrong for me. And, like, you know, nowadays you look at, you know, anybody who has, like, some background in, in military tactics or, or whatever could probably look at it and just been like, uh, here, here, and here. And also, uh, you should have just shot James Bond in the head and walked away and dumped his body in the fucking ocean. <laughs> like, anybody, anytime, like, if ever I come, somebody, I'm being investigated by MI6, and there's a 007 that comes up, and I have him, like, I captured him, just fucking kill him. Don't, don't get complicated about it. just fucking kill him. Yeah, that's like uh, if if there was a part of this is like now that my wall is complete, I'm gonna stand at the edge of the beach with this loudspeaker and loudly shout my plans across the channel <laughs> at England. Like, oh, he's doing it again. Somebody take the fucking loudspeaker away. Um, now that we've talked about all of these defenses that the Allies were arrayed against, because that makes the the main topic of today's episode make a little bit more sense, or at least the idea behind it. We're gonna talk about Exercise Tiger. Sometimes it's known as Operation Tiger, but there's an actual military operation known as Operation Tiger, so the whole thing gets kind of confusing. Um, so everything I just explained to you, the Allies also knew. Uh, they knew if they were going to defeat the Swall, they are going to have to prepare their soldiers for training exercises that would closely mimic the operations they were going to conduct on the infamous day. This is something of a double-edged sword, because they knew this operation was going to be the largest one they've ever conducted. And they would need a suitably large amphibious training operation to prepare for it. Which brings us to southwestern England and a place called Slapton Sands because everything in England is named something ridiculous. And only five weeks away before the coming D-Day landings. Now, Slapton Sands was chosen because according to Dwight D. Eisenhower, it held a striking resemblance to the Normandy coast. Never been to either one, so I can't be sure. I'll take his word for it. Like it's got uh, sand. It's got hills. The fuck do you want? Yeah, it, it's got a, it's got a little bit of hills there. It's it it kind of sucks when you squint at it and throw a whole bunch of armed people. Yeah, fuck it, good enough. Uh, also, it's probably the only large stretch of beach they could randomly launch a military operation on and get away with it. Um, it had a ton of open space, uh, so thirty thousand soldiers, tanks, and other vehicles could come to shore at the same time. At least that was their plan. Uh, now, this would hardly be a training mission if they're just storming a scenic British coastline area and seizing their weird breakfast beans or whatever. I don't know. Um, or their jams and their gollywogs, whatever the fuck it is Nate always says. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you fucking Brits got. We're, we're here for it. Uh, the entire area is transformed into a battlefield. 3,000 residents of the town of Devon were forcefully evacuated, many of whom had never left their town before. Hey, uh, once look, a lot of people join the military to you know, see other parts of the world. Sometimes you just happen to be in that part of the world, and then you get to go <laughs> see another part of the world, because we have to blow up your beach right now. Yeah. So, sir, we need you to leave. Uh, why? We can't tell you, but we need you to leave. Uh, the military okay. has a has a uh, a history of that. I mean, just like the Bikini Atoll as well. Where they're just like, hey, you guys got to go. Uh, they're like, why, U.S. Americans? Why? Why would you? Why would we have to leave our beautiful islands? Like, we're going to turn into a chunk of glass, uh, and then for, we're going to move you back in for funsies. So, come on, <laughs> let's go. And then, don't worry, we'll give you your houses back. <laughs> it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, Look, they're Ikea houses. They're all flat pack now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awful. Uh, hey, now your house comes free with a healthy dose of you're going to die in five right. years. <laughs> you're, on the bright side, you won't have to worry about defaulting on your mortgage that will also take from you. The downside is that all of your children will be deformed. The upside is your dick doesn't work anymore, so you can't have children. <laughs> And we'll probably turn you into some superhero origin story in 60 years that you won't be alive to see. Now, once uh, all the people were gone, Allied commanders went to work turning it into a battlefield. They strung up barbed wire and then decided to plant no shit live landmines, concrete obstacles, and trenches. 
The tens of thousands of soldiers taking part in the uh, training mission were also issued live ammunition, explosives, and everything else they would need to storm Normandy. Joe. Joe. <laughs> now, look, I, I fully understand, you know, live, live ammo training. Um, it's good. Live ammo doesn't, doesn't, it just don't hit the same way that blank does. So I, I understand that. But like, what? Why live landmines? Like, who's that helping? Like, does somebody, uh, do they have a way to trigger? Like, because, because sure, you and I have done, you know, basic training where they have like the simulated explosives in the can or whatever that they're like, sure, you know, don't, don't run over here. Just run over there. Uh, and, and then you're fine. But like, what, what does a live landmine do for you? What, what how are you training here? So it, it's not a good idea. It's a really bad okay. idea. But the, <laughs> but the idea was the engineers were going to clear the beaches like they were going to clear the beaches in Normandy, which, remember, is only five weeks away. <laughs> so, like, this is pretty pertinent stuff. I, but also, I'd hope that the engineers would know how to handle landmines by now. Okay, sure. But, like, put inert ones in there so that they can find them and then they can dig it up. Like, I don't know. Look, I understand it's 1940s. Maybe there's not a way to, like, you know, make it so that like if you fuck up the landmine, it like puts up a little flag and be like, oh, you fucked it up, Jimmy. You got to, you know, go back and try it again so that we can just yeah. bury rocks or right. something. It, <laughs> um, it gets worse. I promise of it, you. Of course it does. Go ahead. Uh, so now if outfitting a bunch of soldiers with real weapons and ammo and making them sprint through minefields sound like a really bad idea, this is where I get to say it. Wait, it gets worse. So. It's important to note that most training exercises before missions are meant to drill very specific jobs, duties, and things of that nature that are supposed to be so difficult or otherwise complicated that they're thought they need extra training outside of that of a normal soldier to make sure that their mission can be carried out. A good example of this is like the D-Day Rangers scaling Point Du Hoc or the Navy SEALs building a exact reconstruction of Osama Bin Laden's house in which they ran drills in for literally months before shooting him over and over again until you can work out all the kinks. I mean, shit, even in the Civil War, uh, the United States Colored Troops did this before the Battle of the Crater, which obviously, as everybody knows, did not turn out well. Um, Okay, this is where I get to tell you that this is not what Exercise Tiger was about. According to British historian Giles Martin, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's entire purpose for the training mission was, quote, he wanted to put them out there in the rough waters in the channel to have them shaken around, expose the seasickness, everything else that soldiers would be prone to do. Yeah, that's that, that's a very like <laughs> that's a very old school general kind of way. Like, oh, we got to make sure that they have the right stuff. Um, and, and yeah, like you said, this is, that's a completely like, I already know how to throw up. Like, I don't need training on how to throw up and you know, <laughs> shit myself. I've seen you do it. Right. Like, do yeah, uh, Like, we need, tra- we need training for these guys and what to do after they shit their pants. Like, I, I will figure it out. Like, you do, please train me on like how to get over these obstacles. So I'm blast we- your boot and you kick it out. Right. <laughs> right. It's like I look, I I am sure that I will will operate perfectly fine with the pants full with pants full of shit, like, but I need to know how you know to overcome these barriers with my pants full of shit. Like otherwise it doesn't that doesn't help me at all. Yeah, it was just supposed to be it's it's kinda like the thing that you were talking about where I know and when I was a patient, we call it night infiltration, where they're just like scaring you. Sure. Uh, which that, had no training value no, whatsoever. Wh- no, where you're just like low crawling and they're shooting an M60 machine gun over you, and it's just like this is what this is what battle is going to be like, and it's not. It never was. It's, I never had a battle anything anywhere near le- that. I don't think anybody ever did where you had to low crawl through fucking puddles. But uh, you know, it was they, what a, what a, how else were they going to do it? I guess other than and it was only the thing about that that is that was one night near the end of basic training for me. Uh, all the rest yeah. of it was like actual, like, here's how to put your pro mask on in case of emergency. Here's how to uh, deal, you know, here's how to do shooting, you know, um, I don't know. It, it's, it was one day to do it. And like, let's be honest, it was kind of fun. It was kind of exciting and exhilarating. Oh, totally. Yeah. 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 But uh, nobody died when I did it. So go on, Joe. So here's my plan for my night infiltration course. All right, basic training's only going to be held in central Texas. Hot as fuck. It's going to be August, so it's like 120 degrees, 115 or whatever. Full battle rattle. And we're just going to have you stand on the side of the road 
for like 12 fucking hours. Now, the mission is EODs on the way. <laughs> and then at one point, a drill sergeant is just going to drive past you and try to take a shot at you while you're probably pissing into a bottle. And then th- th- he's going to drive off. And if you didn't get hit, you're not going to be really sure what happened. And then you're totally going to brag about it for the next 30 years and start a coffee company. Exactly. And that's night infiltration now. I mean, but yeah, he was the, this whole training mission, which is, which is taking tens of thousands of soldiers and hundreds of ships, all boils down to that same three hours that we did at the end of basic training, where you're just trying to scare people who are all already done with training. They, they, like, they didn't need to be like turned into soldiers anymore. Right. Um, it's like, we had this extra night and like, rather than let you do anything fun or let you sleep in, we're just going to like shoot a machine gun over your head for fun. Yeah. Uh, this is exactly like if you tried to train for like an MMA fight, but your hands are handcuffed behind your back. And the only thing you're doing is getting punched in the head. Like, what did you learn? <laughs> well, I don't know my times tables anymore. <laughs> so speaking of Supreme allied commander, Dwight Eisenhower, who was, Actually watching the entire thing from a nearby ship, he decided that all of these really bad ideas that he had come up with were not just shoelace eating insane enough on their own. This was amateur hour. He needed his army to go pro. I'm going to let you take a wild guess at what they did to, 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 to turn this to 11. Uh, let me see. I'm going to say that Eisenhower told the ship that he was on to start shooting at the other ships. Close. <laughs> very, very close. So he ordered the British Royal Navy to fire on the beaches right before the soldiers were going to land. Something that, and this is important, the soldiers were not told about at all. <laughs> like, fire, like, like fire artillery onto it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Sure. And they were not warned about this at all. Uh, now, according to a veteran of the mission, a guy named Paul Gerolstein, uh, quote, they told us nothing. They told us absolutely nothing. We didn't know a fucking thing. <laughs> Somehow this is way funnier coming from a 93 year old man. Because I can hear the I can hear the 19 year old private in his voice with that one. Like he, he for the last like 75 years that that has been running through his head. They didn't tell us a fucking thing. Those bastards. Yep. Of all the shit he's been through, that's the thing he's still the most bitter about. Uh, And what is super important to remember during this entire thing, this training exercise is supposed to be a secret. Totally secretive. The Germans can't know about it. Because remember, at this point, they don't know where D-Day is going to land. So you know what a really good way to keep a secret is? No. Just fucking kill everybody? Like, that's Uh, really the only way you can do it. (laughs) You use a three-mile-long convoy of Allied ships, 300 of them in total, to start slowly making their way towards Slapton Sands, aboard which there's 30,000 soldiers. It's a really good way to keep a secret, right? Uh, So almost immediately, these ships began to break down, get lost, or otherwise fuck up the strict timetable that was in place the training mission required. Not only uh, were they hampered by all those problems they were ha- they were hampered badly by a terrible communication system that rendered many of the ships totally and completely unable to talk to one another most importantly nobody could talk to the landing ships carrying tens of thousands of soldiers i'm very glad to hear that even like now we still have see back then they at least didn't have like cell phones to fall back on like like every training mission in the united states inevitably goes to where we all just like pull out our cell phones like fucking god damn it the daggers are down again the nobody knows how to how to uh load a single channel into the singar just just fucking text them hit them up on whatsapp <laughs> snapchat that motherfucker my grid coordinates all right so funny story about that that was not only in training missions uh during large portions of my time in northeast afghanistan during my first deployment there uh, our radio simply did not work in the mountains. So our th- our third line of communication after our radio is failing and then literally sending a guy running up a mountainside with another man pack to try to get uh, a, a, like a relay with the French base that was nearby was to use a Afghan cell phone. The Afghan cell phone always fucking worked. Always. Yeah. You, you want to know why they're so good at like blowing up our Humvees and shit? It's because their cell phones always work. 
And it's always well, in Nokia. always get four bars. You, you wonder what happened to all those brick Nokias from the 90s. They're all in Afghanistan and they're killing soldiers. Like if not, if not, <laughs> if not triggering an IED, just dropping them on us from a, from a drone. And after the fucking 500 pounds of HME goes off and turns the MRAP to dust and kills four people, the Nokia tumbles away completely and harmed right. to be reused again. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, this isn't the surprising part. Almost every military mission I've ever taken part in uh, has been delayed or otherwise ruined by bad planning. That's include the smallest patrol to the largest con op I've ever taken part in. It just never works out. But rushing through a situation normally only makes things worse. Um, are you ready to tell me? Are you ready for me to tell you how things got worse for everybody? That's exactly why I'm here, Joe. As the landing boat slowly made their way towards the shore behind schedule, nobody informed them or the Royal Navy to adjust their timetables. To make things worse, uh, Eisenhower saw the setbacks and decided, fuck it, we'll just change the timetable. This, of course, was not relayed to most of the landing ships or the Royal Navy. So just as the boats hit the shore, the Navy opened fire on their own men. Uh, that's, not, that's not optimal. They sprinted directly into a full bombardment from the Royal Navy, which, rem- remember, they had no idea was coming at all. God. Shells rained down on the confused soldiers, and many of them tried to run only to find themselves surrounded by barbed wire landmines. In the ensuing chaos, 300 soldiers were killed. Thankfully, the bombardment was called off as soon as it began, but since this is a fucking naval bombardment, it did not take much to kill 300 people, and the damage was done. Yeah, that's... That is a what? Like, just in, like, five minutes, 300 people die. Like, that's incredible. I think it it would probably be more like 30 seconds. Jesus. Like... Not no guns fired a second salvo, so it was like, oh god, what have we done? <laughs> and since like no radios worked, I have to assume they had like had transmitted back to the the ships by doing the fucking panic symbol from um like um Team America, just flailing their hands wildly and hoping that they stop shooting them. All right, Joe. Well, I know I know that not just three hundred people died on this, so please continue. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, Now, this is where every training mission would have been called off if every training mission ended with hundreds of people dying. A fucking training Uh, mission would get called off if somebody stubbed their toe really hard. Like, (laughs) but go on, please. We've got like, whoops, we fucking shelled ourselves. Let's take our ball and go home. But Eisenhower did not play by those ball game rules. Instead, he decided to take a crack at attacking the speech the next day, which, despite containing zero fucking enemies, had solidly kicked the entire American army's ass and caused heavy casualties in a very short amount of time. But just because there's no Germans on the beach did not mean there's no Germans there that day. Like I said before, hundreds of thousands of men and hundreds of ships carrying radios and other kinds of communication equipment just hanging out in the English Channel tends to draw a lot of attention. Not to mention, it was already a pretty well-known fact that German S-boats, U-boats, and E-boats trolled the channel looking for shipping lanes and other military-related things to blow up and hurt England. Uh, A German torpedo boat under the command of Bernd Klug noticed this giant presence on the radar and swooped in to attack. The Germans saw a collection of landing craft and immediately knew that they'd be the easiest target. So they ignored all the actual battleships and blew up the landing craft. Now, Gerolstein was about was aboard a boat LST-515 when he watched a torpedo race directly under his boat, because remember, the landing boats are flat-bottomed, and the flat-bottomed boat saved his ass. Um, But the boat next to him, uh, LST-531, was not so lucky. The torpedoes meant for much bigger ships than these landing craft pretty much totaled whatever they hit. Um, it blew ships apart and threw people through the air and atomized people who were too close to the detonation. People unlucky enough to not be killed immediately were burned alive or thrown into the freezing waters of the channel and died from hypothermia. How, how didn't they have radar? Like, how do they not just see a, a German torpedo boat? Like, off? I have no idea. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> Like, cause, cause this is, this is one of the things that I read about it. And I just, I really want to like, I, I need, I don't know if we need to talk to somebody here. We need to dig somebody up to just be like, how, like, I, I don't know. Like maybe right maybe they didn't have underwater radar very well at that point. Like I just, just a German and like, imagine the balls on this guy to see like, 
massive amounts of like battleships and landing craft and being like, well, target rich environment. Let's fucking do it. I got four torpedoes. I got four hits. Let's do it. And then we'll fucking get out of here. I mean, I have no idea how the fuck they managed to do this. Cause like even something as simple as, um, scout planes or spotters or, or something, but, uh, it, it, nope, nobody really knows. I guess like at the, at this point, it's like the entire, uh, like uh, uh, all the survivor accounts just kind of shrug their shoulders because like Eisenhower never fucking talked about this shit uh, for good reason. Yeah, uh, like he would never have been elected president if he's like, yeah, there's that one time it killed you know a thousand of your children. My bad. All right, Joe, tell me how it gets worse. So one of the problems when why so many soldiers that fell into wa- into the water and died, dis- uh, and, and and even though the water did kill a lot of them. Um, because of how cold it was, many people who fell into the water should have survived. The problem was, is that they got these new life belts. Um, not many people probably remember what these look like. They kind of look like a bandolier that they wore in um, Saving Private Ryan. Now, the, the life belt has to be put on a very specific way for it to work. These soldiers had never been shown how, meaning when they put it on incorrectly, they flipped upside down. And got stuck there. Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Many people had never even seen their life belts before or not issued them. Allied command in London immediately panicked and ordered all the ships. uh, So like instead of counterattacking, because nobody has any idea what's happening. And uh, remember, uh, what's important here is not defending these soldiers. What is important is keeping the secret of D-Day. So they knew they had to get the fuck out of there. They ordered the ships to, to scatter. Just get the fuck out of there. Um, also, it probably helped that Eisenhower was there, and he's like, I don't want to fucking die. Um, this now, is, like, all I can think of is, like, you remember, I don't know if you remember, but, like, a couple, like, a year or two ago, the army was like, hey, we'll let you guys roll your sleeves again uh, based on command decision. And, like, I think that stopped, like, in 2006. So, like, nobody knew how to roll their sleeves. And so yes. I was like... Hey, let me give you all like a block of instruction because I'm I'm old school army. I know how to do it. There's a specific way that you roll it up and flip the end of the thing so that you know it it, the, it covers up and everything. And so I held a block of instructions on how to roll your sleeves. And it's just incredible to me that nobody was like, Hey, by the way, here's your new life your life belts. Here's how to put them on. And like, because I can imagine like here's the when you say incorrectly, and then what you describe is they're just putting it on upside down. And yeah. come on, we have we have mines that literally say front towards enemy on it. Like, why is, <laughs> like, is this is this like the, the time when they're starting to realize, like, we really need to soldier proof our shit and just like put an arrow that says this way up on it somewhere. I think that was actually one of the things they did to fix this problem. Yeah, but, um, real easy. A good way to yeah, a, a good way to soldier proof anything is kill a whole bunch of soldiers with it. And the ones that survive won't do that again. Uh, <laughs> well, and this is the problem. It's never soldier proof. It has to be designer proof. Like, 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 honestly, if you picked up the AT4, you know, anti-tank thing, like if you didn't look at the, the thing, you wouldn't know 100% which way to, to point the fucking thing. Like, I mean, kind of like if you sat down and thought about it, but like in the heat of battle, you need to like, okay, what is this? And then it's like got the instructions on the outside and you slap the thing open and then you put it up and this way, you know, point it this way and then you pull the trigger and it's real fucking simple. Uh, but I guess you have to, yeah, you got to kill like 15 people before you're like, oh, we should put an instruction manual on the device itself, I guess. Yeah. I think my favorite part of the AT4 is it has not just words, but pictures as well. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. It's like, it's like the perfect dumb proof weapon. Like, uh, what if they can't read? Fuck. Why'd we give them a rocket launcher? Well, and what that does is just makes it perfectly easy for like any enemy to pick it up and be like, uh, I don't understand English, but I understand front towards enemy. So let's go. I mean, it will come in handy when in the future we supply it to Kurds that we then abandon. Right. So like, you know, we know you guys can't read English, uh, but here you go. Like, Thanks. So one of the important problems with this training mission is once they told boats to scatter, that left hundreds of men stranded in the water many of whom would die there. Several ships ignored the order to scatter, f- attempted to fight off the German patrol, and began to rescue people from the English Channel. Now, this is where they finally gave up on Operation Tiger, or Exercise Tiger. 
At this point, nearly 1,000 soldiers were dead. Now, Jesus the Christ. number is is not <laughs> total. Like this number fluctuates between like 950 and 1,000 because they simply never found some people, which I mean, this wasn't a battlefield. If you lost a thousand people in the water, you'd be like, yeah, we can assume he's dead. Like, he's not captured. He didn't just get buried under a mound somewhere. Like, you know where he went. There's, but yeah, there's, there's absolutely at least one person like who survived the shelling on the first day and was like, "Fuck this! I'm disappearing into the English countryside. Fuck all <laughs> this! I'm just gonna go br- be British now." And it's like, you know, f- sired, fuck this like, is Nate's five- origin story. <laughs> <laughs> sired like nine children in, in England it's just like yeah they uh the French blew you know blew up my buddy and I said fuck all y'all I've been Sla- it turns dead. out slapped in stands is pretty nice this is way nicer than fucking Arkansas <laughs> I'm just gonna stay here <laughs> now uh nearly a thousand people were dead and in comparison that is more people than were killed in action at Gold Juno and Utah beaches and only slightly less in the slaughterhouse of Omaha Beach during the actual D-Day operations <laughs> I, and the, like I, the American military will never be outdone by anybody, including killing American military. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why they invented the Humvee. Like, what? Is, <laughs> how can we completely mechanize our military but give them the worst fucking vehicle on earth to do it? Uh, let's make the armor canvas. Good idea. Promote <laughs> that guy. Uh, now, one survivor of both the training exercise. And the Overlord Landing says that uh, that Tiger was way worse than D-Day. So I guess that means Eisenhower's training plan actually worked. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, at least like you know when you when you're landing at D-Day, it's like, hey, we're not getting shelled by the French. Cool, already already one up here. Yeah, we just like there's all these machine guns that sucks, but like at least I can move. This is cool. Uh, and the the Navy is actually hitting the target they're supposed to. Now, uh, it is important that there was two things taken away from this training plan. Uh, One was the communications. The radios were almost entirely overhauled within five weeks to make sure this did not happen again. And uh, I think they spray painted an upward pointing arrow on their training belt. So, you know, that was worth a thousand people dying. Now, everybody involved was sworn to absolute secrecy Uh, to uh, to underline this wounded men. And, and survivors were thrown in a group of nearby abandoned houses under armed guard. <laughs> Many of them did not receive medical treatment for days. Like, who's, who's, who's the guys who agree to, to do this? Like, like to, do the, to, to be the armed guards. Like, I'm sitting there with, like, you know, a whole, like shrapnel in my leg. And, like, oh, God, I need, I need a doctor for, like, three days. And, and like, there's an MP there. It's like, like, again, th- I guess this is just, like, the, the, the deep assholery of an MP. Just be like, I know it's fucked up, but I'll fucking shoot you if you try <laughs> to leave, motherfucker. I know it looks like that's getting a bit gangrenous, but I'll fuck you up, man. I like my odds. It's the only one I can win. Uh, and so after a while, they were eventually moved into their own wing of a nearby military hospital under lock and key under strict orders not to say a fucking thing to anybody. They couldn't send any letters or telegrams home to their family. And if they did, they were threatened with immediate prison time with no trial. You couldn't get away <laughs> with this right now. Like, you know, somebody, <laughs> right? somebody would be immediately tick tocking the uh, the French bombardment and like some. Some weird, like I don't, I don't know what movie you would be able to pull a line from to, uh, to 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 do a TikTok, but it would be it it would be both cringeworthy and funny at the same time. Somebody would fucking live tweet drowning. Yo, this landing craft is empty. Yeet, and it's your last fucking tweet ever. <laughs> he got yeeted out of the boat by a fucking <laughs> torpedo. <laughs> uh, so uh, one thing uh, there's actually a uh, the the biggest downside this operation to military command was not the egregious loss of life it was losing a couple guys who happened to have the actual real d-day plans on them uh not because they were like oh no we lost our plans the worst part they thought was like they could have been captured because remember they abandoned them in the water or their body could have been recovered by the germans hence giving up the entire normandy plan incredible like why would you send somebody in like we're not doing D Day, but here's all of uh, here's all the plans for D Day. It's like <laughs> it's like having a mobile skiff, you know. Like 
<laughs> why, why do you have that? Why do you why are you letting somebody go into battle with a laptop on their back with all of our uh, all of our information? Because you know, like the login information is duct t- is taped on the inside of it because nobody can remember sixteen random characters that you need to log in. <laughs> it can't be a word, vowel, or 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 name of any place on Earth. Oh, exactly. Fuck. It expires in thirty six hours. Uh, now, like this, actually, deadline the entire D Day operation for like. Day, like at least three days they were like fuck we don't know we can't launch the operation if we don't find those guys and they eventually did find the men's waterlogged corpses and the plan went on without a hitch so yay, you know, yay we found the dead guys <laughs> now uh, according to the stars and stripes which was published immediately after the war uh, the families of the ones who lost loved ones in Eisenhower's colossal fuck up were told absolutely nothing about how their husband's dead or whoever died. Most of whom would simply be told that their loved one died in the date in which it happened, like something of the Soviet Afghan war. <laughs> yeah, here's a here's your zinc coffin. Sorry. <laughs> but the, by, this isn't my husband. Oh, fuck. We got him switched up. Well, he's yours now. Uh, and now. This was kind of like a really badly kept secret for about four decades um, because only a few years after the war ended, I think it was like 1947 or eight, that the government quietly admitted what, it ha- what had happened and then never said another fucking word about it. So it kind of slowly vanished from public knowledge. It, like, it was something everybody willfully forgot about for a while. And then, you know, obviously like the Korean War happened and we had more important things to worry about, I guess. But uh, yeah, it, it was like everybody just forgot about it. There's always another war on the horizon to erase all of the uh, all of the colossal fuck ups from the time before. At least, you know, the back then the army for uh, the army center for lessons learned was a lot easier. Like now it's like, okay, how do we do, you know, counterintelligence? How do we, you know, integrate ourselves inside in the uh, uh, the customs and courtesies of the local people? And like back in the 40s, it's like, what if we put an arrow on some stuff so that people don't drown? (laughs) That's good. Good idea. Good idea, General. Here's another here's another silver star. Guys, I got an idea. What, what is it? What if we have radios at work? Holy shit. Why didn't we think of that? Well, they still haven't done that, so. Yeah. When, what did when... these people learn in the military academies? <laughs> like, I really want to know. I've had two West Pointers on this show. And I, need, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm calling out all the service academies now. Why are you a thing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> They learn how to bang rings on, on things. That's about yeah, it. And- and, and pay homage to Confederate statues uh, that still litter the <laughs> campus. Um, uh, you know, and that, th- this secret was kind of kept under wraps until the 1980s when the residents of the air began to find jacket buttons, piece of blown apart vehicles, and shrapnel when they began to build along the coast because the army just kind of threw a whole bunch of dirt over it and called it a day. <laughs> <laughs> that's about right just yeah just pull a bulldozer in shove some stuff on it we're, we're good we'll go get on out of here you know that like i know this was something thought of by like a, a, a an admiral or whatever but this is a plan a specialist would think of like well i can't fucking <laughs> see it it's gone that reminds me of a story i heard about um in in afghanistan these guys were building a um a motor pool and their uh their dirt mover whatever they were using hit something metal and so they dug it up and they found a fucking buried Connex and, <laughs> and they cracked it open and it was full of M249 machine guns. And they're like, what the fuck? There's no paperwork or anything. Like they're all still packed in grease, like never, never pulled out, never fired or anything. And so what they figured was like somebody somewhere like got this and they lost the paperwork for it. And there was nothing they could do about it. They're like, we don't know what's in here. Like, well, we know what's in here, but we don't officially know what's in here. What do we do with it? And like some some commander was just like, look, I need you to message to Garcia this the fuck away from me, okay? <laughs> and, and so like some specialist in the middle of the night or some staff sergeant more than likely was just like, fucking bury it. I don't give a fuck, man. Let's get rid of it. We just, we just can't look at this motherfucker. Oh, uh, man. Like, well, I can't see it. It's not here. I am literally a T-Rex human being. If, it's, right. if, it's, if it doesn't move, I can't see it. Here's the thing. We're not missing a Connex full of M249s. Therefore, this is not our Connex full of M249s. Therefore, if it is buried again, and that's what they did. They're like, what the fuck do we do with it? Like, oh, fucking bury it, man. Let's move the motor pool over here. Let's never <laughs> talk of this again. I assume they picked all the bodies up because nobody said like, yeah, it's weird. We find a whole bunch of skeletons. But, uh... Yeah. Um, well, they had to find those D-Day plans. I wonder if they're like counting bodies, and when they got to like six hundred, they're like, "We got the D-Day plans. We're good. 
We don't need to find that, the rest of them. That's a probably a really good joke about what happened. Uh, that's probably exactly what they did. Like, well, <laughs> we know we're missing 400 people, but we got the three plans. So then the Eisenhower is like t- tapping his watch. The sharks will take care of the ones in the water. We're good. <laughs> British sharks. I mean, they they definitely uh, they definitely would eat some things uh, that that are that are just floating around wearing monocles and top hats and shit. Um, now. That was not all that shit was nothing until a local fisherman hooked a fucking Sherman tank embedded off the coast. Jesus Christ. <laughs> fully intact and full of ammunition. I mean, when which you is say, like the coolest thing ever here. here, Like, obviously, he didn't pull it up. So, like, is it my line is cut on? So because I'm not a fisherman, but I have been fishing. And I know that if you're lying, if your thing gets caught on something, you can't get it out. You're just like, I'll just cut the line and we'll get a new lure. So. Did he like that, dive? It, did he dive. It was down just like a like, cartoon. He hooked it and he's like, whoa, whoa. And the, the line <laughs> bent a little bit and a whole fucking tank came up. Now, it was like some kind of net based fisherman. So God, after okay. it got caught on something, he dove down. And he's like, well, that's not what I expected to fucking find. <laughs> and uh, so he wanted to buy the tank because who the fuck wouldn't? Um, after negotiating with the United States government for several years, he bought the rights to the tank. For fifty dollars, <laughs> just fucking take the tank, dude. Why even talk to anybody about it? Like, it's your, <laughs> who's it's gonna fucking tank. stop you? Right? Like the the American government's not gonna come. Like you said, how long was this af- afterwards? Like forty years? Like, uh, almost forty years. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think the government's gonna be like, shit. We need that. Like, just fucking take the tank, bro. It's yours. It's on your land. Oh no! They found our strategic reserve. Right. You caught it. It's yours. That's how it works. That's the law of the sea. I assume. Yeah, if it, the the known law is is if you catch a tank, you now own the tank. Um, and then he pulled it up from the seabed. I would like to assume he pulled all the explosives out first, but probably not. I mean, why? I'm sure that those were inert, right? We, uh, if there's one thing that the British uh, know, it's that uh, uh, unexploded ordnance after 40 years will never explode ever, ever, ever. Never. That's why, uh, like, the German cities are routinely sending out EOD teams to find fucking unexploded <laughs> ordnance from World War II. Um, that tank uh, sits in Devon today and is the only memorial for the thousand dead men that had happened that day. And it still, it still sits there. It's the only memorial that exists for the mission. Sounds like a Patreon pilgrimage. Uh, yes, yeah, somebody fly me there and I will climb inside the tank and make sure it's still full of ammunition. And then I will drive it through the English countryside. We, we only, the, like the only mem- war memorials that I ever want to go to are memorials to absolutely fucked up things that should never have happened. Yeah, but, that's a shame that the Navy can't have any memorials because they just keep crashing into each other. But, you know, <laughs> but that, that is, that is operation slash exercise tiger. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it is the largest loss of life in any training mission ever. That's phenomenal. Like, I just, I'm, I'm surprised by the hubris of like, losing 300 people and just being like well we worked out that kink so that's not going to happen again like to be yeah, fair that probably can't happen twice right <laughs> right and, and to be fair like you know nobody expect uh, no i'm i'm actually not going to say to be fair because like if you're if you're doing if you got 30,000 soldiers and all of these people uh, all of these you know boats and shit you shouldn't say like, well, I mean, I'm sure the Germans wouldn't show up to this, right? And fucking, of course they would. <laughs> like, you know that they're around. You know that it's not this. It's not like us and ISIS, where you're like, well, there's not an ISIS person. There's not an ISIS fighter like you know in my neighborhood in St. Louis. That would be fucking ridiculous. Like, no, you should always assume that there's like a German U-boat off off the bow somewhere. I mean, shit. There's German U-boats everywhere. There was there there was cities along the eastern coast that would uh, have like forced blackouts at night so they didn't spot targets of like the east coast of the united states so like they should have known that at any point in time this all could have been fucked by a german u-boat and imagine that guy uh uh that 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 stumbled upon there with his with his u-boat patrol i think they were s-boats but whatever and they're like no fucking way what the fuck is going on right now i imagine Eisenhower's face during the entire time was just that gif of Michael Scott from The Office doing the cringe face. <laughs> just like for two days straight. Just like, Ugh. His entire army explodes. <laughs> no! No, no, no! <laughs> it's, it's outstanding what they could get away with. Also, I'm, I'm forced to believe that things were kept such a secret that like after 300 people got blown up, like none of the other soldiers knew about it. 
Well, it's not like you're going to tweet it like, oh, fuck. What the fuck? Like, they, you know, you have to send letters or wires and, and at this point in time. Like, you could actually get away with, uh, with, with keeping things secret back then. There's absolutely no way. There'd immediately be, like, some bored specialist who's, like, hiding somewhere, smoking a cigarette, and then watching, like, people get blown up and, like, would immediately be putting that shit up on Periscope. And that person Not to mention, me. like, every, <laughs> every single person is a fucking uh, GoPro on their helmet. Right. Like, fuck, everybody harvest the GoPros off your dead friends. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I don't even know how to close this one out other than, like, maybe Eisenhower should have been fired. <laughs> but Man, he wasn't. It, there, there's a lot of generals that should have been fired at some point in time. But, uh, hey, this I is... I counter fire all generals. All generals are bad. <laughs> Fire them like out of a cannon into the sun. In, into the sun. They can, they can command their armies from the sun. Uh, so, Francis, would you like to plug your pluggables? Yeah, y'all know me. Uh, what a hell of a way to die. You're probably listening to it. If you're not, you should listen to it. Uh, imagine uh, a, bunch of, a couple of angry veterans who try to be funny, but instead just get mad about shit and also were leftists. Uh, so... It's kind of like, you know, a regular military podcast, except we're not racist. So you got that going for you. And I don't even have to plug mine because you also plugged Lions Led by Donkeys uh, with that same sentence. Yeah. So um, if you would, if you think our show is worth a shit and you want to support it, you can do that on Patreon. Uh, our show will always be free, but a dollar gets you one bonus episode a month, gets you access to our Discord, which we share with Francis in the hell of a way to die. Um, and it's always a good time and covers literally everything um if you think you want to give more than that five dollars more a month will get you two episode the two bonus episodes a month will get you a copy of my book the hooligans of kandahar uh access to the discord early episodes and ten dollars and more gets you everything i just named plus a sticker so there's that uh also we will again be using the patreon to donate to the kurdish red crescent to help uh what we can in the coming uh, almost assuredly is going to be ethnic cleansing that is going to visit Rojava. So everything you give will either go to my producer or go to a good cause. And, and I would argue it's a good cause in, in keeping his lights on. So uh, thank you for listening to the show. Francis, thank you for stopping by. This is the first time I got you on a regular episode. Oh, hey. Yeah, we don't normally do bonuses. And speaking of, we got to get ready for our next bonus. We got a lot of garbage stuff to watch. So much, so much bad stuff to watch. <laughs> Until next time, y'all.